Right. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so we are still in LU2. Okay, to resume our lecture, we are still in LU2. LU2 is non parametric tests. Um, so previously we talked about um, sign tests. Okay. That's the simplest uh, non-parametric test that we have uh, covered. And then in the following week, we cover will concern sign rank tests. Okay. So the difference is this test is more sensitive than sign test. And then uh, we talk about men weekly tests. Yeah, men weekly tests. Um, so men weekly tests, it is used to uh, analyze two independent samples non-parametric data okay and in this week we are going to cover another uh, non-parametric test called crosco wallis test okay the crosco wallis test so i have um included some introduction of crosco wallis test in ili so why we what is actually the purpose of uh, crosco wallis test and what's the difference between crosco wallis and man written test so in that we need test, uh, we use the test to compare two independent samples, two independent samples, yeah, uh, derived from two populations. But if let's say we have more than two samples, more than two independent samples, uh, we cannot use men we need test anymore, but we have to move to uh, classical Wallis test. Okay, so that is uh, what classical Wallis test is all about. Is a test is a non parametric test used to analyze more than two independent samples, uh, not just three, uh, it could be four, but at least three. Yeah? So the, the rule is more than two independent samples. Okay, uh, so that is what we are going to cover today. Um, So the name is a uh, classical Wallis test. Eh? Uh, I suppose it was introduced or established by a statistician uh, called classical Wallis. So that's why it is named so. Eh? All right. So some of introduction. So first we we're going to have a look at the introduction of the test uh, in and its application, and the the second part is what are the steps in the test. Eh? So the test is also called hash test. So if you remember, uh, man Whitney test is called U test, right? Um, so in that test, you can see that the parameter that we calculate, uh, there is a U parameter, right? So in this cross the test, uh, we're gonna calculate another parameter called H, H. So that's why it's called hash test. Eh? All right, um, it deals with three or more random independent samples. So the key points here are uh, three or more, more than two actually, more than two independent samples. Yeah, so another one is independent. Eh? So that's the difference between uh, cross the wallis and man with me. Okay. Um, where do now have a use key independent? Okay, so it means that Let's say we imagine we have more than two samples. We have three, at least at least three samples. So we want to see whether, again, um, this test, uh, I mean, any test in statistics, we want to compare the difference in the mean of sample one, sample two, and sample three. So when we want to construct our hypothesis, uh, null hypothesis will say there is no difference in the means of sample one, sample two, and sample three. But uh, for the, uh, for the, 
for the now uh, for the alternative hypothesis is the other way around. There is a difference in at least one of the means. OK, here because we have more than two samples. Uh, when it says. Um, it's not stated here, where is it? So the alternative hypothesis, uh, when it says here, the means or the medians are not equal for all samples. So they are, uh, you have to consider um, two conditions. I mean, like, uh, they, they can be like, it's not just about not equal. Okay, let's say we have uh, mu1, mu2, and mu3. Um, the alternative hypothesis, it can fall in the situation where all of them are not equal. Okay, so that satisfy this statement. Another statement, another condition is it could be only one of them is not equal to the rest. For example, mu1 is not equal to mu2, uh, mu1 is not equal to mu3, but mu2 is equal to mu3. Okay, so this situation is also, uh, uh, this situation also makes the, the whole situation falls under alternative hypothesis. Okay, so this is what is meant by uh, at least one of the at least one of the mean of the samples is not equal to the rest. Okay, whereas if let's say we have uh, just now two and three is equal, but one is not equal to either one of uh, two and three. Okay, I hope you understand what I mean. Okay, so there are two situations for this um, condition because there are three samples. Okay? So if we are talking about two samples, it's, it's easy. La. It's mu1 is not equal to mu2, that's it. Okay, because there are two samples. But when we have three samples, so it could be under two situations. All of them are not equal, or at least one of them is not equal to the rest. Okay. All right. Um, back to the introduction. Uh, okay. So, uh, question one is is a non-parametric test. Again, we are still un, uh, in. We're, we're still discussing about non-parametric uh, tests, right? So uh, if let's say we want to, to find an alternative to uh, this test for parametric tests, it is actually one-way ANOVA. It's, it's equivalent to one-way ANOVA. So one-way ANOVA is uh, used for parametric data. Okay, parametric data. Okay. Um, so this is just for your information. If After this, after... You have covered LU3, then you can understand this statement better. Okay. Uh, it's based on the ranks of the data. Okay. Uh, so previously we talked about ranks as well, right? For man with T and also for the uh, yeah, for man with me. So so this one is also about the ranks. It means that we are going to rank our data after this uh, when we analyze it. Um, another thing, another parameter that you have to uh, take note in this test is K. Uh, K is equal to the number of samples. Number of samples. Okay. So after this, we we are going to refer uh, K, right? So K is a uh, number of samples. H is um, there is a there is a parameter of H in the steps after this. Okay. Now let's go directly to the step of uh, what are the steps in this test. Um, so the steps for this question was, is a bit lengthier than men with me. So please take note. Okay. Uh, so altogether there are. Um, it can be two situations. If let's say uh, we accept uh, the null hypothesis is up to step six, but if we reject the null hypothesis, then we have to proceed with step seven until step nine. Okay, now step 10, so. Uh, well, actually step 10 is, oh yeah, step 10, yeah, that's correct. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the steps first, yeah? Uh, the first step is to set the hypothesis now an alternative hypothesis. So I've mentioned about the hypothesis just now. Uh, step two is about combining and rank the data. So now we have three, at least three samples. So 
we have to combine. What is meant by combine here is we consider all the data at the same time, and then we rank the data. So rank the data means from the lowest to the highest. Okay, so find the value, the lowest value, and then uh, rank it as the first, and then uh, you rank it uh, accordingly, right, until the biggest uh, value uh, of the data in this uh, samples, okay? Uh, and you have to apply tight ranks whenever necessary. So if you have uh, data, similar data, for example, uh, two of the data, let's say is 23, and there is another 23 in the second sample. So uh, you have to apply the tight ranks for that uh, to a particular data, okay? And then after you rank the data, step three is to calculate the sum of ranks and also NI. Okay, so here, if you see as I, I here re refers to each of the samples. So if let's say we have three samples, so we have to find S1, S2, S3, referring to each of the sample. Okay, so I is just refer refers to the uh, to the general term of every sample. So NI is equal to the number of number of data in, let's say, sample one. So let's say we have uh, five data, five, five data in sample one. So NI is five, and one is five. So N2, uh, N3, uh, so you have to find the N, the number of data for every sample. So that is um, NI, yeah. So the sum of ranks here refers to, yeah, after you have after you have assigned the ranks for every sample, then you have to calculate the sum of the ranks for every sample. Okay, step four is to calculate H. Okay, so this is the formula for H. We don't have to memorize the formula because the formula will be given in the exam, uh, but it's just that you have to know how to use the formula. So here we have N. So if we see here, here, N doesn't have I. So it means that N here is actually the total N, the total number of the data uh, of all sample. Okay. Uh, that's the difference between uh, the symbol N and NI. Okay. So just now NI refers to every sample. Um, so another thing that you have to know is SI. Okay, here, so this is the summation, right? The symbol of summation. So how, what, what does this expression means? Uh, you have to, let's say, SI square. So if, let's say, you have three samples just now, right? So it means that this expression refers to S1 square divided by N1. Okay, summation, summation is plus. S2 square divided by N2 plus S3 square divided by N3. And the whole thing here you have to sum, right? So sum before you uh, multiply with uh, this term, okay? And this one you have to solve it first, lah. this, 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 uh, this term, this, yeah. So, uh, meaning to say that you have to know how to use the formula. You have to solve this one first, multiply with this, and then uh, you subtract this from the whole thing here. Okay? Uh, and it's important for you to uh, solve it correctly. Like, for example, you solve this one first, because if, let's say, you don't apply uh, this rule, you will get uh, incorrect value of k at the end. Okay, all right, um, step five, compare H. Okay, so once you get the H value over here, so you will need it uh, to compare with, okay, this, this uh, term is called chi square. It's not X, huh? so if you see, it's a little bit different from X. X is like this, this is a little bit like, like this. Okay, so this is what we call chi. And this square is square, so that's why we call chi square. Okay, so where to get this chi square value? 
So for this, we have to refer to a table called chi-square table. Okay, so that is the table needed for this uh, test. Uh, and the table will be given as well in the exam. Okay. So this is uh, the chi-square distribution. Yeah. Chi-square, this is chi-square distribution table. Okay, uh, so what are the information that you need uh, in this table is uh, alpha, this is alpha, actually, alpha, and this is V, or it's called degree of freedom. Degree of freedom. So the symbol is V. Okay, so alpha will be given to you. Alpha is uh, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, depends on the question. But if the question doesn't state it, you have to define by yourself. But you have to mention somewhere in, in your workout, let's say, assuming alpha equal to 0 0.05. So that statement is needed. Okay. Now, uh, V is the degree of freedom. V is equal to K minus 1. That's the formula of V. What is K? K is the number of samples. So if you have uh, three samples, so K is 3. So V is K minus 1, 3 minus 1. So V is 2. Okay, uh, and the value inside this, this is the chi-square value that you are looking for, okay? So if let's say your just now k is 3 minus 1, 2, so this is the value of v that you are referring to. So if let's say the alpha is 0 0.05, so this is the value of chi-square that you have to um, refer to. Okay, so that's how you got the chi-square value. Okay, now go back to this uh, step. So step five is to compare the h and chi-square values. So once you got the chi-square values, once you have calculated h in step four, then you compare the two values and uh, the rule of thumb. So this is uh, the decision rule. So if the h is greater than the chi-square value, so you have to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so just remember, just remember this condition. Uh, so means that if if h is less than chi squared, so you accept the null hypothesis. It's the other way around. Okay, so this is what we call decision rule. Uh, you have to remember. Okay, you have to remember. All right. Uh, so that is step five. So step six is to determine whether we accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay, based on step five just now, uh, if uh, if h is greater than chi square, so means that we reject the null hypothesis. So what does it mean? We accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, you can say you, you can also say the uh, you uh, accept the null uh, accept the alternative hypothesis. So this one is also equal to a set alternative hypothesis. Okay. Uh, so uh, that is important because uh, step six will determine whether you will have to proceed with step seven or you just uh, conclude up to here. Okay. So if let's say uh, you accept the null hypothesis, meaning that there is no what what is what does it mean when you accept the null hypothesis? No difference uh, of mu1, mu2, or yeah, depends on how many samples you are analyzing. And let's say there are three samples. Means that there are there is no difference between mu1, mu2, and mu3. So means no difference means that's it, right? That that is the the end. Okay. But what happened if let's say uh, we reject the null hypothesis means that we accept alternative hypothesis. So back to our uh, hypothesis, alternative hypothesis in this case means uh, mu1 is not equal to mu2 and it's not equal to mu3. Or we can say that yeah, it's different from mu1, mu2, mu3. But we uh, this one, uh, this Alternative hypothesis can also be at least one of the one of the mu 
is not equal to the rest. Okay. It's not equal to the rest. So if let's say uh, we accept the alternative hypothesis, we have to find out uh, what is actually uh, the specific conditions, which, yeah, which mu is actually, is not equal to the rest. Is it mu one? It's not equal to mu two and mu two is equal to mu three, or is it mu three? It's not equal to mu one, but it is the same with mu two. So that is actually what we have to uh, figure out uh, more, okay? And uh, that is until in step seven, until step uh, 10, okay? Uh, so that's why here step six is very important because it will determine whether you just stop until step six or you proceed um, with step seven until 10, okay? So the key point here, if you accept, if you accept the null hypothesis, you just end up until step six and you make a conclusion. But if you uh, reject the null hypothesis, means that see, if you reject the null hypothesis, you need to find which means are not equal. So you have to proceed with step seven until step nine, uh, step, actually step 10. 10 is uh, making a conclusion. And this step, uh, steps until from step seven here, it is called a uh, Bonferrini inequality procedure. The procedure is called Bonferrini inequality procedure. Okay. Now let's have a look at what are all of these steps. Uh, step seven. Um, so what is, what is needed in step seven? We have to find SI. Actually, it's uh, SI bar. SI bar for every sample. What does it mean? Uh, we have to find SI divided by NI. That's, that gives you the SI bar or the average of the sum of the rank. Okay, so remember SI and NI, we have determined them in step three. Okay, so by right, you should have already the values. So you just have to divide uh, SI divided by N to get SI bar, okay, or the average sum of the ranks. Okay, that is step seven. Um, step eight is to find DIJ, okay, DIJ, and this is the formula of DIJ. So what does DIJ mean? So if let's say we have um, we have three samples, huh? S1, S2, S3, okay. So these are the data that we are analyzing, supposedly. Um, so uh, DIJ, IJ here is referring to any two pairs that we develop from uh, the existing samples that we are analyzing. Okay, and D is referring to difference, D, okay, D. Uh, so we want to actually find the difference. Uh, let's say we assign D. IJ, let's say IJ is referring to, let's say we are focusing on sample one and sample two. So, so we assign D one, two. Okay. Uh, means that, okay, now let's talk about first uh, possible, possible pairs. So what, what I mean by possible pairs here, out of three samples, we can have S1, and S2, the pair. When we talk about pair, there are two, two things, right? Okay. And then we can also have S1 and S3, right? Possible pairs. And the last one is S2 and S3, isn't it? So it means that there are three possible pairs that we can uh, match from three samples. Uh, but if let's say we have four samples, then we can have more uh, possible pairs. It will be actually the the workout will be much lengthier. Okay, so now let's have a look at three pairs first. Uh, three samples first. So these are the possible pairs. So it means that we want to find out the difference between sample one and sample two, sample one and sample three, sample two and sample three. Okay, so that uh for that we assign uh the D D one two. D13, D3, 
two, three. Okay, so these are the things that we have to find out. The IG means that we're going to have three values of uh, the difference. And how are we going to apply the formula? So remember just now we have calculate S1 for every sample. Okay, as uh, the, the, this one, step seven. We would have, let's say, three samples. We would have S1 bar, S2 bar, S3 bar. See, for every sample. It's not only one value. Right? So it means that we have three values. So this, these values that you are going to uh, use in the formula here. For example, if let's say you want to find D12, so it means here, this one will be S1, this one will be S2, and please don't forget uh, this symbol. This is the absolute value. Means that any negative values will be positive because you are just considering the absolute value. Okay, so let's say the difference here, minus four. Uh, so you just take out four, not, uh, not negative four. Okay, so that's what it means here. I hope you, you know this, uh, Symbol, yeah, absolute, uh, absolute value. Okay, and then uh, the denominator here, uh, the square root of the whole thing. Uh, so here n, it doesn't have an i, isn't it? So n here is referring to the total number of the data uh, for all samples. Okay, let's say n1 is 5, n2 is 6, n3 is 5. So n will be... 5 plus 6 plus 5. Okay. The total number of data. Right. And I and NJ here again refers to which pairs that you are uh, comparing. Yeah. For example, D12. So here it will refer to N1. Here it will refer to N2. Okay. So that's, that's how you solve the D for every pair. Means that you will have more than one uh, D value. Okay, but you have to level correctly. Yeah? For example, like this one, D12, D13, D23. Okay. Now that's DIJ, step eight. Step nine, you have to calculate a critical value, find critical value from normal table. Okay. So the, uh, the formula that you have to refer here is this one, this one. Actually, this one is equal to this, but you just refer to this. Okay. Uh, so that is the that is the critical value. But here uh, is a little bit uh, not to say tricky, but you have to take note. Okay. So once you solve this value, let's say this is actually the area of tell. This is area of two. No, sorry. Let me look at critical value yet. Okay. First, you have to find the critical, uh, the area of tell, which is this one. Okay. So let's say our alpha is 0. Uh, 0. 0.05. Okay. And then K is 3. And 3 minus 1 is 2. So that's how you solve this. And you got the value. Let's say, open it. Over point zero five divided by six, that is zero point zero zero eight three. Okay, so this is the area of tell, area of tell, not yet the critical value, eh? uh, because the critical value is actually the z value. Okay, so what do you have to do with this area of tell? You have to refer to a normal distribution table. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at the table. So there are two tables that you have to look at for this um, test. The first one just now is chi-square distribution table. And the second one is the normal distribution table. Okay, so now uh, when we have a look at the steps just now. Huh? So this is the area of tell. So what does the area of tell means? So if let's say we have the distribution, the, the normal distribution, this is the tell. This is a tell. 
an area is actually the uh, the regions under the curve. So this one is actually denoted by 0 0.0083. So this one this is what you calculate just down here. So that is the area of tail. So now we want to look for the Z value that corresponds to that uh, area of tail. So how to know that Z value, which is actually the critical value. So we have to refer to the uh, Z distribution table. Okay. Uh, Z distribution table. Okay, let's have a look at the table. So remember, our tail average just now is um, 0 0.0083. Okay, remember, just now when I solve this value, I'm just giving you an example when alpha is uh, 0 0.05, when k is equal to 3. But if let's say you have k equal to 5, so your tail area will be different. You have to calculate it based on this formula. OK, so this value is just an example, not uh, not the value for all times. So, right now, let's have let's have a look at this uh, example just now. Right? So we have to find what's the Z value that corresponds to this tail area. So in order to know that, we have to know the rules of using this table. So when you want to find this is a normal distribution table, which means that it will give you this, uh, the Z value and also the area. So this, this is area, but this area refers to when, for example, if let's say we start from the origin and we have the Z value, let's say uh, the Z value is um, 0 .0 0 0.52, let's say 0 0.52. So let's say 0, 0 0.52, let's say the Z. Huh? So if we refer to the table 0 0.52, and this is the area which is actually represented by this, right? 0 0.1985. Meaning to say that in order to read the values in the for this table, we have to start from the origin. So, but what happened if let's say we want to find, let's say just now we have the information of um is uh, 0 0.0083, what would be the area here, isn't it? So for that, you have to know the, the rule of this uh, Z distribution table by yourself, meaning to say that the total area for one side here is 0 0.5. That one is you have to know by yourself. It's not given in the question, okay? Uh, this is the rule of normal distribution table. Uh, so the total area is 0 0.5. I think you have learned this in your admits in form five, <laughs> the rule of normal distribution. Uh, so in order to know the area here, so you have to subtract 0 0.0083 from 0 0.5, isn't it? So this will give you 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0083. That's equivalent to 0 0.4917. Okay, that is the area for this site. Let's say name is A. So only then you can find what's the Z value. Because if you see this one, the rule of this table, it will be the Z corresponds to the area from the origin, from the zero axis to whatever it is here. Okay, now. We know 0 0.4917, so how to read the Z table, the Z value? This, this is, we have to go from the inside, from the area inside, I mean like this, this uh, the values inside, okay? 0 0.4917, we have to look for the nearest value in the table. 4917 is somewhere maybe here. For this, okay, we we find we get, uh, we look for the, the value higher, eh? so zero point four nine one eight, that's the nearest. We don't get the exact value, but we find we just take the nearest value. So, uh, the Z value that corresponds here should be two point four zero. Okay, 
So that is the Z value. The Z is 2.40. Okay. And this is the critical value that you are looking for in step um, step 9. Okay. Now, we got this Z value, which is 2.40. So that is the critical critical value. Okay, so what you have to do uh, next. So find the set value that, okay, this is done. So uh, you have to compare DIJ. So remember when you uh, solve DIJ in step eight. So let's say you have three samples. You have three D values, right? So you have to compare each of that D value, D1, 2, D1, 3, D2, 3, with the critical value, which is the Z value. Okay, Z value. So you have to compare and make a decision for every pair. For example, uh, D1, 2, D1, 2, D2, 3, D, uh, D1, 3. Okay. So the decision rule is if the DIJ value is more than the critical value, which is the Z value, so you have to reject the null hypothesis. And if it is less, so you uh, accept the null hypothesis. So just remember one condition. So if it is the other way around, you just um, flip it, okay? So meaning to say that for every pair, you have to make a decision whether you accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay, that is step nine. And step 10 is to make a conclusion. Yeah, you can see that for every test, the last step is always to make a conclusion. Meaning to say that uh, at, uh, at this point, at, after you have completed step nine, uh, you already know, let's say we accept uh, null here for these two, and the other one, we reject the null. So your conclusion, you should see that um, sample, let's say, because uh, one, two, two, three, here is referring to samples, right? Uh, let's say sample one, two, and sample two and three, we accept the null hypothesis, meaning to say that sample one and sample two, uh, sample, well, you can put, accept null means there is no difference between the two samples, whereas reject null means there is a difference. So you can say that there is uh, no difference between sample, let's say uh, one and two, and two and three, but there is a difference. Let's say this one reject now. So one and three has a difference. Uh, so there is a difference between sample one and three. Okay, so that's how you construct the conclusions. Meaning to say that you have to state which pairs that have a difference and which pairs that do not have a difference. Okay, that's on your decision in step nine. So from there, you can see that we, we can have a specific uh, conclusion. We don't say that they are, uh, we, we just, we just, uh, we do not end up saying that uh, mu one is not equal to mu two, it's not, equal to mu, it's not equal to mu three, but we state specifically which pairs that have a difference, which pairs that do not have a difference. And all of this make the whole thing fall under alternative hypothesis, okay? I hope that's clear. All right, so let's uh, wrap up all the steps. Okay, so there are 10 steps. Step one, make hypothesis. Step two, you combine and rank the data. I'll give an example after this. Step three is to calculate the sum of ranks and also the end of every sample. Step four is to calculate H. Um, step five is to compare the H and the chi square value. So you have to take note on this symbol, which is chi. So the square is square. 
you have to find the chi-square value from a chi-square distribution table. And then in step six, you have to make a decision whether you accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so if you reject the null hypothesis, means that there is a difference in the samples that you are analyzing. You have to proceed with step seven until step ten. Step ten, and step seven until step ten, they are called conferring inequality procedure. Okay, so that is uh, what the procedure is, is named. Right. Step seven, you have to find the average of the sum of the ranks. So you see the symbol of bar over here? That means average or mean. Okay, so it's this, the formula is simple. It's uh, equal to the SI. SI is the sum of the ranks divided by the N of uh, the number of data for every sample. So you have to have uh, sorry, you would have uh, average sum of the ranks. If let's say three samples, three values. Okay. Right. So for every sample. Uh, step eight is to calculate DIJ. So DIJ is the difference for every pair. Okay. So how to know that? It depends on how many samples you are analyzing. Three samples you have to uh, develop or you have to match the pair as one. It could be one and two, one and three, two and three. So there are three possible pairs. So you have to find D, I, J uh, or D values for every pair. Okay, pair means two samples. And then step nine to find the critical value or the Z value. So how to find the Z value? First, you have to find See, you can see 9.1, 9.2. First, you have to find the area of tail. So how to find the area of tail? So this is the formula, the one that I circle. Uh, it's equal to alpha divided by K, multiply K minus one. What is K? Number of samples. Three samples, K is three. Four samples, K is four. So you find first that tail area, right? You sketch it so that you get the idea what does uh, that area of tail means. So once you solve the area of tail, you have to find what's the Z value. So how to find the Z value? You have to refer to a normal distribution table. So in order to refer to the normal distribution table, you have to know how to use the table and what does the tail area means. So you cannot find directly the Z from the tail. You have to subtract the tail area from the total area of one sided, which is the 0 0.5, okay? So you refer to the normal distribution table, find the Z value, and that will be the critical value. Z value is equal to critical value. And what you have to do with that Z value, you have to compare it with the DIJ value that you have obtained in step eight, right? And then you have to make a decision for every pair. Okay, that is step nine. So this is the decision rule, okay? And the final step is to make a conclusion, means that you have to state which pairs that have a significant difference and which pairs that do not have a significant difference. So normally this uh, step, the marks will be two marks. So if let's say you just state one condition, pair, let's say uh, pair one and two, two and three have a significant difference but you do not say which pairs that do not have a significant difference, so it means that your marks will be only one. Okay, so please take note, uh, you have to state which pairs that have and do not have that significant difference. Okay. Uh, so there are two tables that you have to take note, chi-square distribution table and normal distribution table. Uh, so these slides, uh, actually it represents uh, step seven to step ten, which is the Bonferrini inequality procedure. Okay, please jot down in your notes. Uh, this is actually Bonferrini inequality uh, procedure, which actually are step seven until step step uh, ten. Okay, so I don't cover these slides. It's actually the same thing. See, the IJ, this. 
Okay, let's have a look at uh, an example. So this is an example given to you. Um, the problem is to compare three different methods. Okay. So from here, we know that it, there are three samples. No, normally in the question, it would not say three samples directly, you know? So you have to know that sometimes from yourself, uh, by yourself, sorry. Let's say there are three, three groups, three methods, but each of that is actually sample, okay? Uh, three different methods of teaching German. Students are randomly assigned to one of the three methods and their exam marks are recorded in the table below together with the ranks of the marks. Okay, normally sometimes uh, the ranks you have to find by yourself, okay? But sometimes they might give you. But this question together with the ranks, does it keep on here? Oh yeah, it should be good. Okay. Assume that if let's say the question doesn't mention about the ranks, okay, meaning to say that you have to solve for the ranks by yourself. Let's say I cancel this statement. Okay, cancel this statement. So this is given to you. This is what given to you. Okay. Uh, so you can see that there are three samples. Obviously, you cannot use man Whitney test because man Whitney is just for two samples. From there, you know that you have to use Pascal Wallis. Okay. Another thing is, you know, a first, the first thing first, you have to know that this is non-parametric data. So how to know it is a non-parametric uh, data because the number of the samples is uh, less than twenty-five. Okay, that's the first thing. And then the second, the second point that you see that there are three samples. Uh, from there, you know that you cannot use sign test. You cannot use um, what's the second? I will concern you cannot use man with me, so you have to use cross Wallis. Okay, that's how you decide the test. Uh, because you are not, uh, you are not asked in the question, use cross. Sometimes they, they will mention, sometimes you have to decide by yourself. Okay, for example, this question doesn't state any test, so you have to decide the, the test by yourself. Okay, uh, so that's clear. And it is not stated alpha value. Alpha is not it's not given. So you have to define by yourself, okay, somewhere in your workout, assuming alpha equal to 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Uh, either one, but that's the two values normally used. Uh, don't use other uh, unfamiliar value like 0 0.04 uh, uh, or 0 0.0. Seven that is not familiar. Okay, uh, the one that is uh, normally used by the statistician 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Okay, why is because of uh, that will give actually the, the the typical observation or distribution. Okay, uh, so they have actually investigated why 0 0.01 and why 0 0.05. So uh, we just have to accept that values. Okay. Uh, alpha is not given. Okay, now let's move to the solution. Yeah? So the step one is to develop the hypothesis. So we have three samples. Uh, so it should be three means. Okay, means because uh, the, the mean value represent every method or every sample. Okay, so we are actually comparing the means. So the hypothesis, uh, now hypothesis, the three means are equal. Okay. Or the same, you can also put mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu1 okay, mu3. Okay, that's in terms of the symbol. So, alternative hypothesis at least one of the means is different from the others, from the rest. You can also, this is me uh, at that point, you can also say mu1 is not equal to mu2, it's not equal to mu3. Okay, step two. Um, if we go back to the, the steps, uh, step two. combine step, combine the data and rank. Combine the data, combine the data and rank the data. And step three is to calculate the sum of ranks. Okay, so from uh, step two, combine the data and rank the data. So it means that we have to look at all the data at the same time, okay, and then we rank it. So it means that we have to identify what's the 
lowest value and what's the highest value. So here, uh, this is the solution actually. The, the one in the bracket is the rank. So I have populated it. So how you see it? Okay, so identify first. The, the lowest value here is 61, right? The lowest value. So that's why I rank it as one. Followed by uh, 67, right? The second one. So that's why it's two and so on, okay? But they are values that uh, that are similar. For example, 72, there are two 72. So it means that here, rank number one, rank number two, and it's supposed to be, uh, hey, number three is there. Three is 69, okay? That's number three. Okay, uh, after 69, the next value is 72, but there are two values, right? So it means that rank, uh, rank number four and rank number five, we cannot, we cannot assign, um, I mean, like, they, they actually share these ranks, supposedly. But how are we going to assign it? We have to uh, find the average of the rank number four and five divided by two because there are two values of 72. So that gives you 4.5. So you rank it 4.5 for both. Okay, they share the same ranks. Uh, so after rank number five is rank number six. Okay, so uh, it's here. 74 is the next value after 72. Okay, uh, and so on. So that's how you rank it. And um, right, uh, that is step number two. Okay, step number three just now is to sum the ranks. To, to sum the ranks means uh, we assign, uh, we, we find what's the sum of the ranks of sample one, sum of ranks of sample two, sum of ranks of sample three. Okay, means that you add up 17 plus four, plus 16, plus 6, plus 13, plus 18, that will give you the value. Uh, so don't get confused with the value over here. Don't, don't sum this value, okay? So it's actually the sum of the ranks. So this is the rank. Uh, so differentiate the rank and the value of the data. So you do the same for S2 and S3. So that is step number number three, yeah, to sum the ranks, sum the ranks. And finding the N, so N1, so you just calculate, you just count. This one is one, two, three, four, five, six. So N1 is six. It's referring to the number of the data for every sample. So this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So N2 is seven. And N3 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And 3 is 5. Okay, so that's how you got this value. Okay, so this is the sum of the ranks. This is the N. And the N here, N here with no uh, subscript. Uh, subscript? Oh, yeah, subscript. So here is actually the total. Means that you sum the N1, N2, N3. You got this total N, yeah, 18. We are 18 data. Okay, step four is to find the H. So you apply the formula. And this is how you uh, substitute the values. Yeah. Uh, so this one is uh, actually S1 square yeah, from here. S2 square, S3 square. Then you sum it, multiply with uh, this expression, right? So you refer to the formula just now. What's the formula? This formula, no? this formula. So even I also do not remember it. So uh, you just have to know how to use it. You don't have to memorize it. Eh? So how you just know how to use it. Eh? So that's H formula. Uh, so you substitute the values accordingly. Right, solve uh, whatever is needed first. Right, this one first, 
and then you got the value of 6.67. So that's how you solve the cage value. And then step five is to find the chi-square and you compare with the h value. So here k is k is three, number of samples is three. Alpha is not given, but if let's say you assume alpha 0 0.05, so means that if we refer to the chi-square table, uh, this is k minus one, the degree of freedom, uh, alpha 0 0.05, so this is the value that we refer to, isn't it? 5.991, so that is the chi-square value. Okay, so 5.991. So we, we compare the H and the chi-square. So the H here is, this is H, is greater than the chi-square, isn't it? So it means that we reject the null. So that the decision at this point, we reject the null. Or means that we accept the alternative hypothesis. What is our alternative hypothesis? The three methods are not equally effective, or not, it's not are not the same. So there is a difference in the in the three uh, methods that we need to figure out which one is actually different. So means here we have to proceed with step seven until step ten, isn't it? Because we reject the null. So how to proceed with that? Step seven, we have to find what is the average of the sum of the ranks. So remember that you have calculated these values before. So you just have to divide 84 divided by six. You got the sum, the average of the sum of the ranks for sample one, sample two, and sample three. Okay, that is step seven. Step, step eight. Okay, step eight is to find DIG. So this is the general formula of DIJ. So remember we have three samples. Uh, so the possible pairs are D12. We match sample one and sample two. Sample one and sample three, right? And sample two and three. So there are three possible pairs. So we have to find what's the DIJ for every pair, for every pair. So you just substitute the value of the terms inside this formula. For example, D12, so S1 minus S2 for this one. And N is the same, which is 18. So here is referring to N1, N2, okay? So you have this value already, actually. You just plug in the values. So this is the value for D12. And uh, the rest for D13 and D23. Okay, so that is step eight. Now, step nine, you have to find first what's the critical value. Remember, just now the tell area. The tell area, how to know the tell area? Uh, the formula is alpha divided by uh, K, K minus one. Okay. Um, how is your value of again? Okay, so means that 0 0.05, let's say alpha, we assume 0 0.05, k is 3, 3, okay, 3 minus 1 is uh, 2, okay, so the value is supposed to be 0 0.0083, actually. The, uh, actually, the, so before this, we assume 0 0.05, then, I think I got correction, it's fine, I just see that. Okay, hello. Let's say uh, the tell area is uh, 0.0083. So means uh, just now, like what I like what I explained just now, we have to find what's the z value. Okay, uh, just now the z value is 2.4 is better again. We need to let uh, about correction. This one is actually referring to alpha 0.10%. So let's say z equal to 2.40, okay, based on what we have uh, found from the z value, uh, the z table. Then we have to compare the z value, which is the critical value, critical value somewhere than z value. Yeah? So we have to compare with the dij value that we have solved for every pair. 
So remember, these are the values that we solved in step eight just now. Okay, so we bring it to step nine, compare with the Z value. Okay, and if let's say this is a decision rule that you have to remember. Okay, this one is uh, what you have to remember. If the DIJ is greater than the critical value, we, we have to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, uh, so let's say we compare 2.04. Don't compare with 2.13 because this one is broader. So 2.04 2 compare with the Z value. Uh, is it greater or less? Okay. Uh, so for example, here is uh, we accept the null hypothesis. This is the other way around. So this is actually the decision that we make for every pair. Okay, for every pair. So uh, step eight to is to make a conclusion. So it means that here, what does it mean for every every of this? If let's say we accept null hypothesis, means there is no difference between uh, method one and method two. Okay, that is actually the conclusion. Reject null hypothesis for one and three, means we accept alternative, isn't it? So means there is a difference between method one and method three. Okay, accept null for two and three. There is no difference between method two and method three. That is actually what it means. So that that those conclusions are those that you need to state in the final conclusion, which is step 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say just now we initially we assume alpha 0 0.05 right? so that is the conclusion. So it means that um, let's say here um, uh, there is no difference between method one and two, method two, two and three, but there is a difference in method one and three. Okay, so yeah, you're gonna what conclusion at the end. Okay, any questions so far? So you can see it's a bit lengthier, lengthier than men with me. So you have to take note on the steps. Eh? Uh, but if you practice a lot, then you know what to do, what you ask, what to expect. Actually, it's not that really difficult. You have to practice. Uh, you cannot just read the methods, the steps, uh, just like that without doing it. Because if you don't do it, then you don't, you don't feel it. Eh? Okay, so that's that's the 10 steps of uh, Pascal Wallis test. Okay, I have some exercises for you here. You have to do by yourself. You can discuss with your uh, group mates. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's it for today. Getting uh, that's right. <laughs> okay, any question? Okay, please, uh, please, uh, please. Uh, please do the practice by yourself and also I have some practice problem in Elite. Okay, have a look at it. Uh, that that uh, um, practice problem, uh, I think it asks you to determine which test you want to use. Uh, it doesn't just cover uh, this one because we have covered a, a, the test before. So I want, I want you in that practice problem, I want you to actually uh, decide which test you want to use uh, it's either sign test, either either sign test or Pascal Wallis or Man with Me or Will Concert. Okay, uh, just just go through that uh, practice problem on Elite. Eh? So yeah, I think that's it for today. Uh, I hope that you have understood. Okay, what are all the ten steps of Pascal Wallis? Uh, ten steps. So. Uh, it's up to step one to step six. If we accept the null hypothesis, but if we reject the null hypothesis, you have to proceed until step ten. Okay. So step seven and the step ten is is equal to Bonferrini inequality procedure. Okay. Right. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll just stop here. Yeah. If you have any question, you can email me. Okay. Uh, if you text me, I might not uh, 
I might not um aware of that. Uh, if you email me, it's much easier for me to track. Okay, so yeah. All right, uh, I'll share back the attendance for those who haven't scanned your attendance. Okay, those who, who have scanned, you can you may leave. Yeah, thank you very much and have a nice evening. Selamat berbuka for those who are fasting. Yeah, come. Thank you, doctor. Right. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Yeah, have a nice day. So, yes. Can I ask my note attendant? What's her name? Leva Shini seven and X zero. Okay, Leva Shini. Yeah. Yeah, done for you. Mohamed Nasri, are you here? Oh yeah, welcome. Okay.